Good night, everyone. This is actually the first time I'm speaking uh, in Amsterdam. Actually, the first time that I, as a Dutch person, am giving this talk to a Dutch, well, a lot of non-Dutch people, as these have discovered, uh, audience. Um, tonight, in this hour, I'm going to spend uh, some time talking about uh, .NET's configuration system and how it works. And secrets will also always be a part of like your configuration management. And so we're also going to take a look at how you can keep these safe. And you might be thinking that this kind of, you know, .NET's configuration system, it might not be a very exciting thing to talk about because we all kind of know how it works, right? Like just putting a connection string somewhere and then calling like, give me the connection string and you're done. But storing these configuration properties, storing these secrets is actually a lot more difficult than you might think. You see a lot of companies doing this in different ways, incorrect ways, some of them in very good ways, but it's, it's kind of all over the place. And that is why I want to talk to people about this, to see, hey, this is how it works in a modern way, this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do, and uh, just you know, keep these things in mind. So, let's start talking. Well, instead of actually starting to talk about .NET's configuration system and you know, a little bit about who I, am, who I am, let's talk about what configuration is and why it is actually so important. Let's start with the real basics. So configuration is kind of the part of the system where you put things that you might want to change over time. So think of things like your feature flags, uh, your logging settings. These are not real business logic. These are real settings. So configuration is kind of the setting screen in a video game, right? You just want to tweak a couple of things. Your business logic doesn't really change. And it is actually very important. Just imagine a world where we would not be able to configure our applications. So that means that we would have like a local test and production environment, and we would then have all of our connection strings to our databases. We would have them hard-coded somewhere in our code, and with if statements, we would use different connection strings. It doesn't work. It's insecure. It's inefficient. We want to be able to use configuration. And like I already said, secrets are also a big part of your configuration management and your configuration system. And with secrets, well, I think we've all kind of interacted with them. There are things like your uh, database connection string. There are things like API keys, basically things you don't want to leak. And configuration and secret management have existed together for a very long time. I would maybe even say kind of since the beginning of software engineering as a whole. But recently with like the complexity of our systems and these rising and it's just becoming more and more, you know, uh, we need to be able to scale up, scale down, or just our systems become more complex. You see that these things like secret management become a lot more difficult. And yeah, as you can see here as well on GitHub in 2019, over 100,000 GitHub repos have leaked like API keys or cryptographic keys. And this is just happening more and more often. This is not stopping anytime soon. So knowing how you store your secrets, knowing how you keep them safe is very, very important. You can build an amazing cool app, but if you're accidentally leaking your database, you're going to be in a whole lot of trouble. Actually, who here has accidentally ever committed a secret into a Git repository? See, there you go. So pay good attention to the last bit of this presentation. Right, let's start talking about how we can keep these things safe. So a little bit about me. My name is uh, Sander ten Brinke. I uh, live here in the Netherlands in, in a city called Apeldoorn, about 90 kilometers to the west, uh, to the east. Parking is a lot cheaper there. Um, and I am a lead software engineer at, uh, at Arcadi. Now, Arcadi is a, is a company that is not really focused on Amsterdam, so you've probably not heard of it. We are a, a Dutch uh, IT consultancy company. And uh, yeah, so me and my colleagues, we go to different companies and help them write awesome and future-proof and fun software. We also do some projects in-house, but you know how it goes. Um, I love working with .NET, basically. If you want to summarize me, I love working with .NET. But as you can see here on the slides as well, I really love doing everything, except CSS, honestly. But for the rest, I really love doing everything. And also what I love doing, it's kind of since that I've discovered like two years now, is talking and blogging and sharing knowledge and stuff like that, like what I'm doing right now. And because of that, in the December of 2022, so a few years ago, a few years, a few months ago, I became a Microsoft MVP, which I'm very happy to be able to put on these slides. Right, enough about me. You didn't come here to listen to uh, who I am. You want to know more about the actual topic at hand. So we're going to talk about, well, four things. I divided this uh, presentation into four topics. First, we're going to talk about the basics of configuration. Then we're going to talk about the options pattern. Uh, then we're going to talk about keeping secrets safe during development. Finally, we're going to talk about storing your secrets in the cloud, because at some point after development, we want to launch our applications. 
Now, this presentation contains a lot of code, and I had prepared like a demo for each of these sections, but we're not going to have the time to talk about each of these demos um, because I would need like half an hour extra. So I have uh, saved the final demo, the storing sequence in the cloud, for last. And uh, if you are interested in seeing the other demos, you can go to the GitHub uh, repo and look at them later. Or otherwise, afterwards, I can go through them with you. Right. Um, we have a pretty you know, small audience, so I think it's fine if you ask questions. Uh, if you have a question, you know, go ahead and ask it. If there's going to be a lot of questions throughout, I might save a couple for them until the end, so we can kind of keep the pace going. So the basics of configuration. What does this look like in .NET? What do you really need to know? Well, the configuration system in .NET is, compared to what I know of other programming languages and other systems, is actually, I, I really like it. So you have an interface called iConfiguration. And in, with this interface, with, this, uh, with an instance of this interface, you can get configuration. But where this configuration is actually coming from is very flexible. So you can have different configuration providers all kind of abstracted away from you. So you can have like an appsettings.json file, an appsettings.development.json file, uh, environment variables, command line arguments, and you can even have um, other sources. Right? You can even uh, create your own configuration provider if you create it like a custom file format. Or, and what, uh, what we're also going to look at in the presentation is storing your configuration in the cloud. So when you're saying, hey, give me a database connection string, it will actually go to the cloud in a very secure way to grab it for you. But we are all developers and we would like to look at code. So that is what we're going to do now. How would it look like, what would it look like to actually use this configuration API? Now, it would basically look like this. We have an instance uh, of the iConfiguration interface somewhere. So here we have a property called uh, configuration. Let me take a look if this thing is working. Yes, it is. Configuration. And this is exactly why I don't really use that feature much, because it doesn't work well. And um, then we have a method called get API key. Now, in here, I want to showcase the two uh, methods to basically, in the absolute basics, get some configuration out of your configuration system. So first, you can call get value with a generic type, in this case a string, and then you pass in the key. This, this, so basically, the configuration bit that you want. And you can also use the indexer, which is the second method, um, which is basically the same thing. Now, I prefer using the first one because it is the, the generic type that you pass in can be very flexible. For example, you can kind of store a time span or an integer or a Boolean in your configuration system, and it will then also um, map it to that type. Whereas the configuration with the indexer, which you might find in languages like uh, PHP, I believe, these will always return a string, and then you would still need to cast them yourselves. So I very much prefer using the get value version, but uh, as you'll see later on with the options pattern, in your real business logic code, you're never going to really use I configuration much, but I'll keep that vague for now. All uh, right, one more thing. So as you can see here, I talked about the multiple provider bit, app settings, environment variables, et cetera. We are not saying which one we're using here. We're not telling it, grab an API key from the environment variables, grab an API key from the uh, app settings.json. This is actually kind of decided for you because the order of the provider matters. Uh, more in that later. And you might find that very weird to hear. I actually very much like this approach. My business logic code should not be caring much about how my configuration system is set up. It should not be hardly coupled to this. I should just be able to say somewhere, give me some configuration and how I set that up at my program startup or something like that, that is what, it, that is what matters. Try to loosely couple your configuration from your code. Right. Now, a thing that I think .NET has and a lot of other programming systems doesn't is that its configuration can be structured. So here we see a, um, an app settings.json file. Who here has not worked with like an ASP.NET Core project? Oh, that's great. Good. Everyone. Um, well, basically, for those that might not really know it, if you create an ASP.NET Core project, for the, for the ones in the chat, if you create an ASP.NET Core project, which is like an, an app where you can like build a web API or a web application, uh, you get a file like this, an app settings.json, in which you store the settings for your app. And this is a JSON file, and JSON has support for objects. And in this case, you can see we have a logging, uh, um, a logging object with a log level object in there. We have an allowed host property. We have a connection strings object with a database property, and we have some feature flags. A pretty default couple of changes to the normal app settings.json, but pretty default, and you can see what you're trying to do. You're trying to configure your system. 
And this is, you know, uh, this, this has structure. And even providers like uh, environment variables and command line arguments can also be structured. We'll probably take a look at that later. And wouldn't it be nice if we can actually also, you know, use C# -sharp and .NET to access this, access this configuration structure as structured code, as sections? And that is actually possible. So again, from the previous example, we can have an I configuration instance somewhere in our code. And then we have two methods here, get feature section and get enable new UI. And I want to showcase two different, well, things that are related to the structure. So we can also grab an I configuration section, which is basically a section of your configuration. Provides the same APIs as I configuration, for example, get value and stuff like that, or the indexer. But now we can, for example, say get section, and then we call in features. And then as you can see from the previous slide, it will grab the features section. And you can also call get required section, and then this will actually throw an error, it will throw an exception, when that section can't be found. This is if I ever use configuration section, again, I never really do because I use the options pattern, um, I use a get required section because I think it makes a lot more sense that it throws an error if your section doesn't exist. Where a get section, for example, it will simply return an empty object if your section can't be found, which makes no sense to me because your configuration system is very static. You set it up somewhere at your application startup and that's it. You never really change it at runtime. You don't change your configuration system when like an HTTP request comes in. So if a section doesn't exist, there's probably something wrong and you want to get an error. So I recommend that you use uh, get required section. Now, that second method, get enable new UI, you, I want to showcase that you can, of course, also grab properties that are in an object. So if we are interested in the value from the, the enable new UI feature flag, you can go, you can go ahead and use features uh, colon enable new UI. And the colon allows you to go one level deeper. So if we would have like four levels, we would be able to use the um, features colon enable new UI colon colon blah, blah, blah. Right. So how does this actually work? How, does, how is this configuration system set up? So what you can do in .NET is you can create a configuration builder, and then you add some configuration providers to it, you build the builder, and you end up with your iConfiguration root. Now, an iConfiguration root is a little bit different than an iConfiguration, where the iConfiguration root um, also has a list of all of the providers that are in your configuration provider system. Well, you're never gonna really use iConfiguration with root much, but you know, I thought you should know. And these providers, they are actually, like I said already, the order is very important. So here we have a great image from the Andrew Locke. He creates great content on .NET. And here he has created an image for me and then also for you, where he demonstrates how this order works. So for example, let's say that we have a shared settings.json, which contains lots and lots of kind of defaults. Maybe we should call it app settings.json or whatever. Next up, we have already have app settings.json, so that won't work. And then we have environment variables. Now, if you look at this from the top down, you can see that uh, environment variables provide the same value for a key uh, as app settings.json. So this means that if you were to say, let's say it's a configuration bit called API key. And if you were to say, hey, configuration system get value API key, it would actually grab them from the environment variables because that one is the last one in the list. So it is the most important one. It has the highest priority. If the environment variables wouldn't uh, have a value for the API key, it would take a look in your app settings.json, and then it would look in your uh, shared settings.json. So the order is extremely important. Now, if you want to see a little bit of code, you can create a configuration builder. You can call some extension methods on it, like add environment variables, uh, add JSON file. There's lots of options on these methods, and then you can call builder.build and end up with your configuration. And then you might be thinking, oh, that's very interesting, but there's a bit of a problem because I work with .NET applications, I work with this configuration system, but you might have never actually created a configuration builder before. So how does this actually work? How can we work with configuration without manually doing this? Well, that's because .NET is a very sensible you know, system to work with. And if you use like an ASP.NET Core project or you use the generic host or you use the web application class that was kind of introduced in .NET 5, you call things like create default builder or create builder. It will actually set up a default um, configuration system for you. And we're going to talk about what that system looks like now. So first off, what you get when you create uh, like an ASP.NET Core project or use the generic host, 
it will add the app settings.json file as a provider, the first, first one. So in here, you can put some app settings. Next up, you have the app settings.environment.json. Now, that is not a literal value. That environment bit in the blue color is replaced with the uh, value from an environment variable on your system, which is the .NET environment or ASP.NET Core underscore environment. And this is actually very, very useful. Because um, has, does everyone here know what the app settings.development.json file is? Who doesn't know? Let me put it like that. Okay. okay, well, that's fine. We'll go through it. So when you create an ASP.NET Core project, you get an app settings.json and an app settings.development.json. And this is actually very useful. Because if you were to take a look in the uh, properties folder and then in the launch settings.json file, you'll actually see that for the running process, it will set the ASP.NET Core environment uh, variable. It will set that to the value development. And now what you can do, for example, is say that, um, let's say we build a feature flag, use the new checkout page. And in the app settings.json, we set this value uh, to false because the feature is not done yet. And in app settings.development.json, we set it to true because we're currently developing it. And because the app settings.development.json has a higher priority, it means that it will grab that value during development. But if we were to uh, deploy our code to production, where this environment variable is set to production, the app settings.development.json file is ignored. So then the feature flag will be disabled. And this way you can be extremely flexible and you know, do a lot of things with your configuration system. Next up are user secrets. Now, we're not gonna really talk a lot about these because um, this is, I dedicated kind of an entire section to, these, uh, to the user secrets uh, bit. But these will only be enabled during development, and these should be used to store secrets on your machine when you are uh, develop, developing your code. Next up are environment variables. Now, environment variables are, does anyone here not know what the environment variables are? Good, we have a very well-educated audience here tonight. So environment variables you can also use to um, store your configuration. You don't really do this normally during development, but you can see a lot in the Docker and Kubernetes world that environment variables are used because they're pretty flexible. And uh, some examples are like the, uh, the path and the path environment variable or the time zone environment variable on Linux, if you want to jog your memory. Finally, there are the command line arguments. Now, the command line arguments, they are pretty well known if you ever run a terminal program. For example, .NET run, and then you can pass in a configuration bit called key, and you can set it to important value. Now, in your code, you could say get value key, and it would then return important value because this is the last highest priority um, configuration, uh, sort of the highest um, priority yeah, provider for this given key. So those are the defaults, and knowing this, it's good, because that means that you at least know how the basics of .NET configuration system work. But there are a couple downsides, especially when it comes to like using it in a structured way. And we're going to talk about those now and take a look at how the options pattern will actually fix this. So let's say that we want to bind multiple values to an object. We have some object in our app settings.json file or somewhere else in one of other providers called external API settings. And it has an API URL, it has an API key, and it has a timeout in milliseconds. And now, wouldn't it be nice to create a class, right? External API settings with the same properties. Because this would allow us to, for example, put some methods uh, on this class to kind of manipulate the data or do some cool things with it, or we can at least pass a concrete type around in our code to give it to an external API client instead of like having to go and grab each configuration bit and kind of you know, assemble it together into a tuple or stuff like this. Actually using classes for configuration is very nice, also for like compile time safety. So how would you do that with the, with the classic approach that I just explained to you? Well, we could have an external API client class and it would have, uh, in its constructor, it would accept an iConfiguration uh, instance so it can uh, access configuration and then we would store that in a private field somewhere. And then we have a method called call external API, which calls an external API. Has two, and now we have two ways to go to our configuration system and take a look at these properties that we just set, the API key, API URL, time out of milliseconds, and then map them to uh, a concrete type. So we can say configuration get section. I should have actually used get required section here. And we can pass in the section name, and then you can call dot get, and then it will pass in the concrete type. In this case, uh, external API settings right there and then it will return the concrete type with the properties because it will look through your configuration system and find those properties. 
Secondly, you can also use uh, dot .bind, which will, in which you can pass in an existing instance. Maybe you want to like update or refresh an existing instance of these settings, and then you know it will do the same thing. Now you might be thinking that's pretty neat, like setting up your configuration system like this using concrete types. What are the problems here? Well, there's actually three pretty big problems. Because this class is now getting an iConfiguration instance, it can now access all of your configuration. So an external API client could also say, uh, configuration get value uh, connection strings database, give me the database connection string, which makes no sense. Why would this class need access to this? It is, a, it is pretty well known that when you're writing code, you want to have, make it have access to as little, you know, to have it as little privilege as possible. So if something breaks, only a little bit of code breaks, not everything. Try to limit the, the things that your code can do. And this thing can do everything. Next up, we are also tightly coupling our external API client to our uh, con configuration system. Because we're saying configuration get section and give me a specific section, which means it knows the inner workings of our configuration system. So if we are now editing our um, app settings.json file, and we are, for example, changing external API settings to external API options, at runtime, your external API client will break, which makes absolutely no sense. These things should never be coupled, but now you've uh, tightly coupled them. Finally, you have magic strings in your code base. And you don't want that because magic strings are bad. You're gonna get also more runtime errors and when you're refactoring your code, you're gonna forget to update these strings. All in all, we don't wanna be using this approach when we are actually talking about um, a bit more complicated or yeah, complicated structured uh, configuration, which is often what you'll be using. So, we're gonna throw this away. Thank you, good. I was really happy that PowerPoint has such an amazing transition in it. And we're going to opt into the options pattern. Now, the options pattern is a way better way to work with configuration. And uh, it provides lots and lots of cool features like uh, encapsulation, dependency injection, it has named options, there's validation, which I'm very excited about. Uh, you can support like reloads on chains. If you change your configuration at runtime, you can kind of you know, update your application with this. And there's also things like post configuration. And we're going to talk about uh, a couple of these that are the most exciting. So, the options pattern is very well suited uh, to be used with dependency injection. Now, there's some people don't really like dependency injection, and for those, there's also good news because it is not tightly coupled. You can also create options with like multiple different ways. You don't need to tightly couple it to dependency injection or to an actual configuration system. I might talk more about that later. So in your application startup uh, setup somewhere, so perhaps in your startup.cs or if you're being very modern in your program.cs, you can call services.configure and then you pass in the concrete type, in this case, external API settings, and then you pass in the configuration. Now this will, when you at some point call the, uh, the options in your code, which I'll already show you to you, when you are now creating, like with dependency injection or some other way, an instance of this class, it will look in your dependency injection container and see if it already set up your, uh, your options for you, the options with the external API settings. And when you call dot value on it, then it will take a look. Like, have I already searched for this configuration before? And if not, I will do so. And then it will be like, ah, the uh, external API settings contain an uh, API URL, it contains an API key, and a time at a milliseconds. And then it will look in your configuration, find those properties, and automatically map them and put them in your dependency injection container. Where the, with the previous example, we had to do that ourselves. And now we can simply say, uh, external API settings is options.value. And now in your, in your call external API method, you just have an immediate concrete type. This is very powerful, because now, we don't have the entire iConfiguration instance anymore. We only have a little bit of data that we need. We only have the external API settings, which, you know, this is better. Next up, we don't, um, have, a con we don't have tight coupling anymore to your configuration system. But because before we were saying like get a specific section and here we're just accepting an I options and you can create options in different ways. You can like create options thanks to the result of an API call. You can call options.create to set up options manually. It is not tightly coupled to configuration. And finally, you don't have any uh, magic strings. So another thing for, uh, that you might want to take away from this presentation that is take a look if you're in your code base somewhere are kind of using configuration in a very manual way. Like take a look, can, you, can I convert like a, uh, like a couple of properties into an object and use the options pattern for this? Because it will make your code a lot more readable and a lot less tightly coupled. 
Now, this was the one, this is the feature that I am mostly, uh, that I'm like the most excited about. We all know, right, that when like a user sends us an HTTP request to our server, we always at some point validate their input. We don't let the user do whatever they want. If the user is submitting a form, we check, is the form, like, is the form length uh, not too long, not too short? Is the user submitting a list? Oh, it must contain at least two items, but not more than five. We really want to limit what the user can do. But I've seen lots of applications that don't validate their configuration. Because wouldn't it suck to have like your test environment and then the intern accidentally changes the connection string to the production database. And then you're testing if like, what would happen if I deleted the entire database? And then you delete your production database. Stuff like this can happen. It's like a pretty easy mistake technically to make. So you want to validate your options. And this is actually very easy with the options pattern. So kind of refactoring our external API settings class we can have an API URL, an API key, and a timeout of milliseconds. And now we can put some um, data attributes on them. These are very common in the uh, ASP.NET Core world. So there are basically some attributes in C-sharp, and they will basically, uh, when you validate this class, it will take a look. Like, is the API URL, API URL, is this, uh, is this property null, or is it just white space? If so, it will be invalid. Same for the API key. And a timeout in milliseconds, it needs to have an integer value between one and 100,000 to be considered valid. And using this, setting this up with the, um, with the options pattern is actually very simple. Again, we can call services somewhere in your application setup, and you can call the add options instead of configure. And add options will return you uh, the options builder. And the options builder allows you to do very, very, very cool things. So now instead of actually passing in a concrete type of configuration, we can call bind configuration and just pass in the string. And now we can say validate data annotations and you're done. Like now when you are trying to inject an I options into a class somewhere, it will, before it will actually do that, it will take a look like, is it actually valid uh, according to the rules that I set up? And, but most importantly, this is actually something I found out when I was making this presentation and I immediately re refactored all of my code, is the existence of validate on start. Because I found out that the options pattern is a uh, lazy and also a singleton. And the lazy part is the most important thing to take away here. The, when you inject I options into a class and call dot value for the first time, only at that point will it actually go to your configuration system and set things up, meaning that's I don't know, you deploy your application, it sits idle for half an hour, and then the first HTTP request comes in, and it will activate a class that wants options. Only at that point will it, you know, grab the configuration and perhaps throw an exception if it's invalid, which it, to me is very weird behavior. I want to validate my options, I want to validate my configuration the second my application starts, because if it's invalid, I just want my application to crash, I want to be informed, I want to fix my mistakes. So validate on start, Makes, makes that happen. When you call validate on start, right when your application is started up, when the host is configured, it will go through your options, validate them, and you'll be safe. Definitely recommend using this. And are there any people here that like use, know and like using Fluent Validation? It's a very popular Nougat package. Good. So for those that don't know, Fluent Validation is like a package that allows you to set up like validation rules uh, in a very fluent manner. So you can have like different rules for properties and stuff like that. You can, you can be very flexible with the um, properties, like the required uh, attri attributes and stuff like that. It's pretty limited. .NET 8 is adding some very cool uh, new uh, attributes, but it's pretty limited. So you can also on the internet find very easy tutorials to set up like fluent validation with this or even custom validation if you'd want to do so. So it's very extensible. And I definitely recommend validating all of your configuration. Now. Keeping things fresh is also very important because I already said the options pattern is a singleton and lazy. Now, lazy can be considered a virtue, can also be kind of considered a curse. But in this case, when we are considering like reloading our configuration when it changes, it is a curse. Because the first time you call dot value, it is red. The second time you call dot value, it will retrieve the cached value somewhere, you know, for better performance. But what if we have an app settings.json file and we, on the, like, without wanting to redeploy our application on a server somewhere, we change a feature flag from like disabled to enabled. And then you can actually have your configuration system understand this and then the, second, the next time you grab that value, that feature flag, it will actually say, hey, now it's enabled. That doesn't work with I options because 
it's cached. So that doesn't work. That's a bit of a problem, but luckily there's some solutions. So the iOptions snapshot interface provides the exact same API where you can just call dot value, except now this is a scope service and it will read your configuration every scope. And a scope in .NET can be basically anything, you can create them yourselves, but the well, most well-known thing is an HTTP request. So every HTTP request, it will take a look at your options and say, hmm, I'm going to take a look at my configuration system and read these um, external API settings again. And for the entire external, uh, for the entire HTTP request, these, um, these external API settings will stay the same. And this is exact, then also very useful with web requests. And I was really ready to like migrate all of my code to this, um, to this iOption snapshot until I read in the documentation that this has, can have extremely bad performance. So if this sounds very useful to you, if you are a person and you're working for on a project that wants to kind of like read, like change their configuration on the fly without any redeploys, uh, take a look at the documentation if this perform, bad performance might impact you. Finally, there's iOptions Monitor. I've never really used this, but it can be very useful. This is again a singleton, and this reads your configuration in real time. So in an HTTP request, that might actually not be very beneficial. Say that in the beginning of your HTTP request, you read the connection string to the database and it's connecting to database one. And then like eight milliseconds later, someone updates your configuration and now it's talking to database two. So your, your next database call will go to a, a different database can cause a lot of syn the synchronization issues. So this is mostly useful where in, a, in a scenario where scopes don't matter. So for example, with background services. And you can also like subscribe to any changes that might happen in your, in your um, configuration system. I haven't really ever used it, but I think it's very useful to know that this exists. Right. That's it for now on the, um, on the options, uh, again, Please start using these and please start validating them. And now let's start talking about keeping secrets safe during development. Because again, secrets are things like your connection strings and your API keys. And prevention of leaking these kind of things starts when you're actually developing your app, kind of maybe when you're making the first commit in a repository. Because if you create a commit in your repository and you leak a secret, you can't really undo it. You can delete the commit, um, but yeah, and you, can, you can't really do this anymore after you pushed it. You can force push, but then also, let's just not start talking about that. So, you don't want to commit your secrets. And let's take a look at how .NET is configured to you know, fix this for us. Well, I want to start talking about this, but first I want to tell you a little story. Does anyone ever, does, has anyone here ever seen this shirt before? Ah, oh, that's a shame. I hope to, to surprise the entire audience. All right, thank you. So. In the Netherlands, if you uh, find like a kind of a cyber security problem in, the, uh, like in, in, a, in, a, in a system from the Dutch uh, government or something and you report it, you get a t-shirt that says, I hacked the Dutch government and all I got was this t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, think, I think this is very funny. I think this is very cool that the government does this. Um, but there was someone about a year and a half ago, I believe, um, that got this trophy, which is of course a lot better. And let me tell you a story about that. So is anyone here visit the website tweakers.net often? Okay. Hmm. Do you know um, Schizo Ducky? Do you already know this story? I know the story. All right, good. Well, so in the, there, was this, there was this Dutch citizen that was just looking around uh, at the GitHub profile of an employee of the Dutch tax administration. Very relevant right now because we're do, doing our uh, taxes. That's the Belastingdienst in the Netherlands. And this uh, employee, had a, had, had a repo uh, on GitHub with some credentials to their private GitLab account. Now, this citizen found it funny to just take a look at their repos because he just cloned all of his repos and just took a look around, not to try to hack him or something, I was just curious. And what he found in there was like lots of plain text, usernames and passwords and stuff like that to all kinds of government systems. So, including the global Azure administrator account. So, he goes to the Azure portal, he tries to log in. Log in successful, but luckily we have a very competent uh, government with very competent IT systems because they had multi-factor authentication enabled. And that employee got a notification, you know, uh, on their phone like, hey, is this you trying to log in? And of course he pressed yes. <laughs> 
And so this Dutch citizen, this guy, was presented with the, like, the, port, the Azure portal as the administrator of the Dutch tax administration. Now, luck, uh, sadly, he didn't you know, change my taxes, but he, he immediately went and submitted this. He called the hotlines and everything, like, hey, you guys need to fix this right, right now. And thanks to that, he got a trophy that said, I hacked the Dutch tax administration and never got a refund. Now, I really, really love telling that story. You might be thinking, how is this really relevant? Well, you know, it's very funny, it's very stupid, like it's very, very insecure. Kind of the message I want to send here is that if you ever leak a secret, don't feel bad, the Dutch government does it worse, right? So, let's get back to .NET, and let's get back to code, and let's take a look at how we could have prevented this issue. And you can prevent this issue by using user secrets. Now, I already mentioned user secrets before in the beginning of this presentation. It's one of these configuration providers in .NET when you're running in a development environment. And this uh, configuration provider actually stores its values outside of your Git repository. So you can't commit them, you can't make this mistake. On Windows, it will store them in the uh, app data directory somewhere. And if you're running on uh, Mac or Linux, it will store it somewhere on the uh, hidden uh, .microsoft directory in your home folder somewhere. If you are running a kind of older project, you need to call .NET user secrets init. Uh, normally in the more modern projects, this is already done for you when you like, create a new project. And now you can set uh, these secrets in lots of ways. You can do this in Visual Studio, you can do this in Writer, you can do this in Visual Studio Code. For now, I'll just show you how to do it in the terminal. So you can call .NET user secrets set, and then you can uh, set a key and a value. And again, be, uh, be mindful of that colon there. This is of course also supporting structured data. So in the JSON, we use like, you know, the, the JSON with the curly brace kind of thing to uh, set uh, structured data. Here in the terminal, you can use a colon, a connection strings colon database. And so you can set your uh, user secrets. And this will kind of store them in a file, uh, kind of like this, and this will store it in a file outside of your Git repository, uh, Git repository right there. And when you start your project and you tell it to, hey, give me uh, the database connection string, it will read it from that file, and if you make any changes to it, it won't, be in your, uh, it won't be in your code somewhere, in your Git history, stuff like that. Right. Now there's two kind of things I want to talk about here. Is that, of course, this does mean that when someone, like a new team member comes to your team and they clone your project, they, and they run the project, it won't work because they haven't set up their user secrets. So it's very important that like in your readme or something, you need to put some, um, some demonstration like how they should set this up. Maybe write a little script for them somewhere that they can run it. Don't put the actual values in it, that makes no sense. Maybe like link them to the Bitwarden or the Key Vault or the secure place where these things are stored so they can put them on their machine and they can start going. Now secondly, what if you are working, I wanted to say for the Dutch tax administration, but they definitely don't care. So let's say NASA and you don't want to leak secrets. So for example, you want to say that my, my developers are working in such a secure environment, they should not even store secrets on their personal machines. What if they have a virus on their computer and the secrets still leak? Then this doesn't really work because the user secrets are more like user kind of secrets or not really secrets because this file, the secrets.json is not encrypted. It's just plain text right there on your hard drive. So it's very convenient, but it's not like a real secret thing that you're using. And what you can do in this scenario is what we're going to talk about in a few slides. Right. I talked about uh, you know, secrets, talked about configuration. I want to share with you what I would do, what I do, basically, in lots of projects, lots of teams, lots of companies to kind of set up a basic configuration system. And you know, things like this are always very subjective. What do I think? What do I like? Maybe you don't like this at all. If you don't, I'm curious to know, but yeah, I'm also curious to see what you think of this. So, I have my app settings.json file. And in here, I kind of make it a template of my entire configuration system. So I say, I have a connection string to a database, but I don't put the actual value in there because that would be leaking a secret. I say, it's in the key vault. Does anyone here not know what an Azure key vault is? Good. Now, um, so then a developer knows when they're cloning the project, when they're learning the project, ah, I need to grab this, this value exists in the key vault. And if they want to change it, they need to go to the key vault. Same thing for the admin password, they need to go to the key vault. And the app settings.json, in the app settings.json, I also store actual values, like the welcome text can be hello world, for example. So it's not all template, it's kind of a mix of templates to kind of tell everyone where to go, and it can also be real values. Next up, you have your app settings.development.json. And in here, 
it's basically the same thing. So here I also reference my user secrets um, uh, to find my secrets during development. I tell developers to please don't put your local connection string to your database in here because I have a different connection string, for example, and then we're constantly commit fighting to override your changes. Uh, just put them in your user secrets. And the same thing for the admin password. And finally, you have the actual user secrets, which I've already shown you. There is, that is the place where you actually store your secrets. And you might be thinking that this is a little bit overkill because it is not that difficult to manage this. But again, .NET's configuration system is pretty flexible. Flexible is a way to put it. You might also say it might be complex. All of these providers, if you are working in a project where like, some, uh, some parts of configuration are stored in environment variables, some in command line arguments, some in the cloud, it, it might be all over the place. It might be very difficult to manage these things. And that is why I think like, kind of creating a template and telling people where to actually put the values is a very good idea. It really makes it easy to discover your project. A little side note. In the uh, Docker and Kubernetes world, again, the uh, like environment variables are very popular. So you could, of course, also change certain things like welcome text could be like from environment variables or something like that, or from like the Kubernetes file. Do whatever you want, but make it clear for the people where their configuration is stored. Good. Hey, let me take a look at the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing pretty good on time, actually. Good. So. Storing secrets locally is great, but we sadly can't ship our entire machine to the client. That, was, is, that is the thing that Docker was intended for. And um, so we want to store them somewhere for our test and production environment. Now, I'm gonna showcase to you how you can do this in the cloud, because I like storing secrets in the cloud, but these kind of principles also kind of work with on-prem environments. But let's talk about the cloud, because the cloud is fun. Um, you could also say, well, why would I need the cloud to store my secrets? Let's talk about this for a bit. Because you could also store them in environment variables. It's safe, it's fine. You see a lot of projects using environment variables like in a Docker container or something uh, to store secrets. That's okay. The thing is, how secure do you want to be? If someone would get access to your container and would list the environment variables, your secrets would have been leaked. So, is that a problem for you? Maybe, then you might consider environment variables to not be that secure. You could also say, and I see a lot of projects doing this, when they are like in their CI CD pipeline and when they're releasing their code, their app settings.json file actually contains things like connection strings database is uh, hashtag, hashtag, database, hashtag, hashtag. And then they replace that token with the actual connection string. And then they deploy their app settings.json file with the value to the environment. That way you don't have it in your source code, you can store the actual value in a secure place and just grab it and put it in your file when deploying. Also works. Because you might also say that is actually good enough because if a hacker got access to my like, actual server, then you're in a whole lot more trouble. So this might be good enough. It might be. But storing them in the cloud can be a whole lot more convenient. So let's take a look at that. Now we just got an entire presentation about AWS and uh, I'm gonna tell you that this kind of entire thing that we're gonna talk about also works in AWS. AWS loves .NET. And you have the AWS Secret Manager. You, does anyone know what the equivalent is in the Google, uh, the Google Cloud Platform? Because I don't. I should, but I don't. Okay, shame. Something with secrets, probably. Um, so, the Azure Key Vault, you can use uh, to store keys and secrets and certificates and stuff like that. And you might be thinking, well, storing my secrets in the cloud, that's very insecure. I don't really think so. Because the, this entire service is focused on keeping your things safe. Whereas in, in your company, storing your secrets is kind of more of a task. It's not your business focus, where this is the entire business focus of this product. They're gonna do it well. You can even pay a little extra and get it like stored on specific hardware, like security hardware. And you can use this, the same thing with AWS and Google and also like the HashiCorp Vault, if you wanna self-host something like this. You can use this as a configuration provider, right? We talked about environment variables, app settings, or JSON, or, or other sources. Uh, the Azure Key Vault is one of them. So in this bit of code on the bottom, you can see uh, config.add Azure Key Vault. And then we pass in a, a URL to the Key Vault, and then we pass in a magical default Azure credential. We're gonna talk more about that in the next few slides, but just see this as the thing that we are like authenticating and authorizing ourselves to access this Key Vault. And now when you say in your code somewhere, um, configuration get value uh, database connection string or something like this, connection string database, it will actually go to the key vault in the cloud, authorize yourself, authenticate yourself, and then grab the value and just store it in your memory, 
which to me is a lot safer. Storing things in memory is technically safer and just a whole lot more convenient than having to set up your release pipeline, having to set up environment variables. This just works at runtime. You don't need to really do a lot of work here. And if you now change anything in your key vault, you don't even need to restart your application. You can just set up caching that, for example, these things are cached for 10 minutes, and without any restarts, 10 minutes later, your application will be updated at runtime. And this also integrates with like lots and lots of uh, other Azure services. Like if you're running like um, like if you're running like Azure Container Apps or uh, Azure App Configuration, Azure App Service, you can like do lots of lots of configuration if this doesn't really suit your needs. Right. Oh, one thing um, that we uh, that I didn't talk about here. We're living all in the Netherlands, right? So money is important to us. This is very cheap. So it, ten thousand calls costs like thirty cents. And I, don't, I feel like we haven't even done 10,000 calls to this API in the last year or something like this. So you're not gonna really notice any costs on your bill. I'm not sure how expensive it is on AWS, actually. Probably a lot more expensive. No, not sure. Yeah? I'm curious, you had mentioned that they're cached. They cached on the Azure side? No, I think when you, when you, like, when you call it to say, hey, give me this connection string, then they're cached in memory. So the second time you, yeah, 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 yeah. I believe that's how it works. They're not, they're definitely not cached on the Azure side. So, in that, if I'm, okay, fine. Yeah, that's so good. In reality, if I'm using the I option snapshot and the change of my configuration is on key vault, is there communication to invalidate that cache? Um, I'm not really sure. I should take a look at the configuration, but if we are really talking about like, in scenarios like this, uh, I would, um, and maybe we have some time left over in the end, there's also a service called Azure App Configuration, which makes this possible. So if we have some time left over, or otherwise afterwards I can talk to you about that. All right, um, I mentioned a scenario where you would be working at like NASA or something, and they would tell you don't store any secrets on your machine. Like, don't, we don't want them on your hard drive somewhere. Then you could use something like this. You could set up that during development, so just locally on your machine, whenever you're launching your application, it actually also goes to the key vault and grabs values to talk to databases or something like that. Maybe you want to have a special key vault for local development. And that points to a certain database or a certain service that you need. And that is actually pretty cool, because that means that I could clone my project, uh, click on run, and be done. Like I wouldn't need to set up user secrets. I wouldn't need to see, uh, set up configuration because it would already be done in the cloud, and that just allows you to be, you know, running your project in seconds instead of having to set these things up. Um, downside: you do, of course, need an internet connection. If you're working somewhere in the mountains, there's none here in the Netherlands, so I don't think you're going to be doing that. But it, you do need an internet connection, and of course, it costs like I don't know a cent per year. Doesn't really matter, but you know, it costs a bit of money. But if it fits your needs, then you can use this for it. Um, yeah, two more slides, and then we're going to move on to the demo. I talked about this de default Azure credential. So the way that you can authenticate to Azure without, uh, you know, we didn't see any like usernames or password in the previous slide. And the way that works is because Azure has very cool authentication systems built in. Because with that default Azure credential, what it will do is it will take a look. Uh, if you're using Visual Studio, are you logged in with a Microsoft account? And is that Microsoft account, ha does that Microsoft account have access to the key vault? If so, it will automatically use those credentials to go to the key vault. If you're using Visual Studio Code, it will do the same thing with an extension. If you're using the Azure CLI or Azure PowerShell or Rider or stuff like this, it will, this is automatically done for you. If you are logged into a Microsoft account, it will just authenticate you. So you don't need to do anything on your development machine to just, you can again, just click on run and it will do all the hard work for you. Of course, you don't have Visual Studio installed on your production systems. So how could that possibly work? Well, the default Azure credential will also take a look if there is an application service principle connected or a managed identity. Application service principle are boring, so we're going to talk about managed identities, which is what I really like to use. So the problem we're trying to solve here is how can we actually talk to a key vault or talk to a cloud service without a username and password? Because if we would need to have a username and password combination in our configuration system to talk to a key vault, we still have a problem. If a hacker figures out our username and password to the key vault, they can log into the key vault and they have, value, they have access to our secrets. So we want to talk without any secrets to the cloud. And Azure Managed Identities allows you to do that. It allows you to safely communicate with Azure services without secrets. It is pretty difficult to explain how this works without an example, so I'm gonna try my best and then show it to you in the demo. 
Um, but kind of an explanation would be that you have a virtual machine uh, or any other Azure service, and it, for, for example, wants to talk to a database. And now what you do is you can kind of see a managed identity as like kind of a fake user that is like kind of attached to this virtual machine or service. And then you also tell the database that this fake user is allowed to access this, um, this database. So when your virtual machine is doing a call to the database to get access, it will actually underwater get a token from Azure uh, Active Directory for you and send that to the database. And the database will be like, ah, that token is for that fake user. The user has configured that this fake user is allowed to access me, so it will have access. And as you can see in a, in a, in a minute or two, this will mean that um, your connection strings contain no username, no passwords, but I can try to connect to my database and it will work, and you can try to connect to my database and it hopefully won't work. Right, let's move on to the demo. Good. Right, very relevant. Oh, I haven't started Visual Studio yet. Okay, whoops. Let me just start up Visual Studio real quick. And let me move this to the second screen. There you go. Let me just make it a bit bigger, I think. Hold up. I'm just gonna duplicate my screen, actually. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Is this readable enough, or should I increase the font size a little bit? Good. Okay, so in here I've created a very relevant application that allows us to see a list of pizzas. And also, we have another endpoint, this is an ASP.NET Core application, that shows us the connection string to our database. Don't do this in production. All right, so let's start with the beginning. So in this application, we are using the key vault to grab a connection string to the database that is hosted in the cloud. Then we are talking to the cloud, to this cloud database, to get us a list of pizzas, but there are no secrets involved here. And also talking to the key vault doesn't include any secrets. For example, you can see here, uh, add Azure key vault, and we have the key vault URI, and then we say default Azure credential, but I don't have a username or password anywhere. The reason this works is if you go to tools, and then you go to options, then you have your Azure service authentication, and it says here that you know, when you choose an account for your apps to authenticate and access Azure resources when debugging. So it will then use this Azure account to talk to Azure instead. Now, that means that when we are saying somewhere, configuration get value, get me the connection string, it will actually go to the key vault to do so. Then we are adding the database for the context of entity framework, and when we say give me a list of pizzas, it will go ahead and uh, go to the database, give me a list of pizzas. That's all there is to it, but I think it, were, it demonstrates all of this very well. I also want to show you these user secrets because it's very easy to manage this in Visual Studio. If you right click on a project, and I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit, it doesn't work, great. You have manage user secrets right here. And if you click on this, then you, this is now that uh, file stored in the app data directory. There, I can make edits to this file and it will not show up in my uh, Git changes. Right, let's, uh, let's take a little look at a list of pizzas. Now I have, run, I have this running locally on my machine connected to the cloud. And you know, it's a demo time, so it will definitely break. This is already taking way too long. Please work. It literally worked like an hour ago. Oh, my internet is down. Oh no, okay, great. Um, let's clear this request. You can quickly, before this times out and shows errors, you can see a list of pizzas, right? So it did work. Let me quickly connect to the internet. It timed out. It should all be cached. Yes, great, good. Long live my computer. Next up, I also deployed this application to the cloud. So I have an Azure App Service, which is in AWS a? There is a service-like Azure App Service. Yeah. Allows you to install this. Is yeah. so man, a managed service that, yeah, anyway, allows you to install. Something like that, Elastic Beanstalk. So that's the equivalent thing. And in here we have hosted the same application. And this is Azure talking to the Azure Key Vault, which is then talking to an Azure database. And this is using that default Azure credential as well. And now to show you the cool thing, uh, if I were to grab this um, connection string to the uh, Key Vault, 
which I have stored somewhere. I think it's stored it right here. No call connection string? Nope. Oh, you set up a, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely need that to show the connection. Oh, okay, so we have internet again. I told you we did need internet for the key vault and it has been proven to be true. And if I go to the key vault and take a look at this uh, connection string to the database, you can see, and I'll open, I'll do this in like notepad or something so you can actually read it. Otherwise it's, you could just can't read it. So there you go. And in here, you can see that I have my connection string to the database, to the cloud, because this is like a database of Windows in that server. But if you scan this, you won't see any usernames or passwords here. The only thing authentication-wise you'll see is authentication equals active directory default. And this is now used to connect to my database. But if you were to try and take a sneaky picture, I didn't see anyone do it yet, so, you know, good job. And if you were to try, it wouldn't work. But it does work for me, and I kind of find that mind-blowing. I find it very interesting that using the exact same connection string for me works, but for you doesn't. And that is because I configured my Azure applications to only accept my traffic. And yeah, this is just very magical to me. I just really like how this works. Now, I store this connection string in my key vault because I just like storing connection strings in key vaults. I technically wouldn't need to because, again, there's nothing to leak. Like it doesn't, the only thing that would leak is like the, the URL to my database, it's not that bad. But still I like storing it in there. But you know, using something like this, you only need to install, I don't, nowadays you don't even need to install a NuGet package anymore. You can just use authentication equals Active Directory default, and you need to click on a few things in the Azure portal to set this up. So in my Azure uh, app service, so in my Azure portal, uh, I have set up that my, um, that my application has a system assigned managed identity. It's basically click on on, and now it creates a fake user somewhere in Azure. And then I can go to my um, Azure key vault, which is right here, and I can go to the access policies, and I can say this, um, there you go, this, Azure, this uh, app service, that the fake user that I created has uh, secret permissions, it can get the permissions. Now I also need to change something in the access policies and the, um, like the role-based access control, but that's not very that important. Technically, this is, only, this is the only thing you need to do to like, talk to a key vault without secrets. And then in the database, you need to execute a query that kind of creates a database user with the uh, ID of the, um, of the managed identity. If you're interested in that, uh, my time is basically kind of up, so I wanna kind of skip over that. That is in the repo, in the, uh, in the file that I created for it. If you're interested in like running this demo completely on your own Azure, uh, in your Azure on your own Azure subscription, there's a file uh, in there that publishes this entire project to the cloud for you. All right, um, good. Let's move on to the final slide. Some tips and tricks. Let me just extend this again. Right. Nope, that doesn't work. Dia voorstelling van de huidige dia. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Right. There's a lot of a couple of things in here that I sadly wasn't able to talk about. Uh, well, first of all, read the configuration documentation. It's a very light read. It's about two and a half hours. Um, so I definitely recommend you do that tonight. It's a great Wednesday evening activity. No, but seriously, take a look at them. Take a look if there's anything that you might want know, uh, to learn more about. Um, yeah, highlight it here basically. Use the user secrets and use your key vault or equivalent because it's just a very good way to keep your secrets safe. Um, also, if you can, take a look at the uh, secret scanning services like GitLeaks. It's a very awesome feature like from that platform where like you have a commit, you push it, and b b before it actually accepts that push, it will take a look if you have committed uh, any secrets into your repository. If you did, it will reject your push, and that way you can also kind of have like a fallback security. Um, use managed uh, identities for connections to Azure services because that way you don't even have any secrets anymore. So there's, if there's no secrets to leak, that's just good and nice to have. And make it very easy to rotate your secrets. If any secrets do ever leak, rotating means that you can just kind of generate new ones really quickly. So if, if anything ever leaks, if it only takes you five minutes to kind of you know, fix a leak, then you know, you're pretty good, you're pretty safe. Every environment you need to new, uh, needs unique secrets. I've seen lots of companies that say, yeah, no, we, you know, security is the biggest principle in our company. It's very good. I say, okay, what's the uh, password to your test environment? Oh yes, it's welcome, one, two, three. Like, yeah. If you're using that exact secret on production, you're not being safe at all. 
and uh, yeah, use role-based access control, use multi-factor authentication. If you're interested in this demo, you can find it on my GitHub profile, uh, github.com slash sander1095. And with that, I want to um, end this talk. If you want to learn more about me, to take a look on these links. My goal is for each talk that I give, I want to kind of write a blog post that covers everything in this topic. I want to start writing that soon. So if you, you know, kind of want to recap, uh, take a look at my website like in a few weeks, and then I'll have that written, and everything I talked about will be featured in that blog post. So thank you for your time. I hope you learned something, and if there's any questions, uh, I'll have to answer them.